Well, good morning, church. It is the last Sunday in Advent, the last Sunday before Christmas. So that means it's time for some of you to start your Christmas shopping. And that could be difficult this year if you're hoping to get something shipped to your house before, say, Epiphany, like January 6th. Uh, So if you're stuck in that situation, I recommend the time-honored tradition of our family, which is a beautifully wrapped and carefully written Christmas I owe you, and then you deliver it whenever you can. Well, this year during Advent, we're looking into the music of Christmas, songs that are not only beautiful parts of the traditions that are associated with Christmas, but that rehearse in poetic fashion for us the Christmas story and the message of the gospel. We began with the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the prayer that expresses the deep longing of the Israelites for the coming of Messiah the deliverer who would usher in the kingdom of God. The song reminds us that the story of Christmas begins centuries before Jesus was born with the words from prophets who told of God's promise to bring salvation through his deliverer. We followed that by listening to Christina Rossetti's In the Bleak Midwinter. The imagery of this lovely song pictures the desperate need in our souls for light that will penetrate our darkness It presents the richness of the mystery of Christmas, the incarnation of the infinite creator God in the baby born in the manger. Last week, we delved into the wealth of the words of the classic carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Charles Wesley's joyous hymn calls us to attention. There is a new king born today, the rightful Messiah of Israel and the Lord of all creation. And so we are summoned to worship to bow before this one who is our king and our God. And we're sent out with the message to tell the whole world what God has done. He has invaded our world, becoming one of us, born as we are born, in order to save us from our sins and to rule over us as the king of God's kingdom. Well, today's Christmas carol follows quite naturally after last week's selection. Joy to the world. It's not only another classic, beloved Christmas song, it is equally rich in its message. Although, like most treasures, there's some digging that has to happen in order to uncover those precious truths. But when we do dig, we'll find one of the most abundant springs of joy this Christmas or any other day. But before we leap into the words of this carol, let me reassure those of you who have been paying attention this morning. I expect that more than a few of you uh, were surprised by the scripture readings for this morning. Um, They were both from letters of Paul rather than from the Gospels, and they certainly aren't the regular passages of scripture that we associate with Christmas. No references to angel choirs or shepherds, nothing about the young couple from Nazareth, nothing even about the birth of Jesus, only a couple of indirect references about God sending the Messiah. But we're going to see in a bit why those passages are especially pertinent for today. It has everything to do with joy to the world and with having a reason for joy. Of all the holidays in the year, Christmas, I think, is the one that brings out the most emotions. I mean, there's a reason that Hallmark Christmas movies are so popular. Uh, They stir up those familiar emotions that we associate with a favorite holiday. And and I'm talking about the positive emotions here, just to be clear. Despite my track record um, about Hallmark Christmas movies. Anyway, honestly though, except for the Scrooges among us who are clearly damaged and in need of healing, Christmas is an emotional time. Those warm feelings of affection when the family is together, the the cheer that comes from a visit with a friend or helping someone in need, that sense of peace when the kids are all finally down for the night and it's quiet, maybe with just the beginning of a soft snowfall. Even the times of sadness, maybe because of the loss of a loved one or, or an unexpected hardship, or because a pandemic is disrupting your plans and messing up your chance to be with your family. Even those sad times are rich because they're tied to memories that comfort and cheer us. 
Our sadness is only there because we remember how great the good times were when we were healthier or when we were younger or when the family was all together. But of all the emotions that are wrapped up with Christmas, the one that is the most characteristic of this holy day is joy. Joy is at the center of Christmas. I have a bucket load full of joyful memories of Christmas, far too many to mention, or we really will never get this sermon finished, and, and I'm committed to finishing it. But the memory that best captures the joy of Christmas for me is an image from my youth. And I can picture, as clearly as I can see you here today, I can picture my four younger sisters in their pajamas, crammed into the doorway at the top of the stairway that turns into the kitchen, coming up from the basement. I can see them there giggling and screeching and jumping up and down on top of each other like a pile of puppies, about to burst until they finally get the signal that they can rush through the kitchen and come out into the living room and set upon the presents. And and they are, for me, the picture of giddy excitement and pure joy that Christmas represents, that Christmas inspires, that that release from all the pent-up tension of waiting and anticipating and the thrill of embracing the experience of receiving a gift from someone who cares about me. That's Christmas. I'm sure you have similar images in your own memory banks of Christmas in your family, whether that's images of your parents or your children or some combination of family and friends that stirs your heart and makes you smile as soon as you think about it. But I'm also sure that you have the shared experience that is common to all human beings. The disappointment that comes when the joy of seeing the new gift starts to wane. When the realization sets in that until something fills that aching inside of us, the best that our traditions and experiences of Christmas can offer us is simply a temporary reprieve from the dull and debilitating desperation that surrounds our days. Our best holiday can cheer us up for a while. But what we really need is joy. Joy that doesn't disappear when the wrapping paper is cleaned up and the decorations go back into the storage room. And that brings us to our carol for this morning, which promises us Christmas joy, not just for us, but for the entire world. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. The original title for this hymn by Isaac Watts was The Messiah's Coming and Kingdom. It appeared in a hymnal, 1719. Excuse me. And from that title, we can see the connection with last week's carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Because the emphatic focus of the lyrics is the Lord who is the king. The joy of which Isaac Watts writes is not the joy that's connected with a mother's affection for her child and the sympathetic feelings of every woman who has ever given birth or would like to. No, it's the joy of the coming of a king into his realm. The glad announcement that there is a reason for joy is this. God has come to the earth to be welcomed as its king. But we can see something else right away. We can detect right away. There's a catch, if you will. There's a condition. Because the joy that the herald announces is for all the world. But the condition for obtaining that joy is the reception of the king. That is, that he be acknowledged as sovereign by his people. Indeed, by every heart. Even the final line of that first verse, which is repeated for great emphasis in the version that we sing, that alludes to this condition. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. The king is the Lord God. The king of heaven has come to earth. 
He who is worshipped in heaven, who sovereignly rules the hosts of heaven, has come to be acknowledged on earth, the only place where he is not acknowledged. Nature must sing his praises, which is to say all of the created order, especially those who bear God's image, must recognize him as their sovereign and yield to him their allegiance and their praise. The line about preparing him room is ironic, of course. When kings come to their subjects, they expect to be given the very best. Hence, we have the phrase, to be treated like royalty. But there was no room in the crowded inn in the small village of Bethlehem where Mary and Joseph arrived. Because she was about to give birth, they were allowed to stay with the animals. Hardly the proper reception for a king. The richness of God's grace is seen at Christmas. He doesn't punish us for our negligence of his majesty. He offers us an opportunity. Christmas is the reminder that God has come to us with mercy. He extends the offer to us to open our heart, to prepare a place for the king to be honored, to prepare a place for the king to be acknowledged as sovereign, to be welcomed. <clears throat> Recently, Mary and I have been watching the Netflix series, The Crown. It's a very lavish, dramatic interpretation of the English monarchy centered on the lives of the royal family of England over the past 80 years or so. One of the things that this series does very, very well is to highlight the sharp contrast between what the royal family thinks, their expectations of how they ought to be viewed and how they ought to be received, and what the common people actually think. Some of the commoners regard the queen and the royals with great admiration and respect. They value the crown. They appreciate their own place in the kingdom. Others are indifferent. Their lives and the lives of the royal family are worlds apart. They see no connection between the two. Now, if the queen happens to help them out in some material way, that'd, that would be great. But for the most part, this group simply ignores the crown. And there are others who despise the royals. They're envious of their privilege and their wealth, and they're bitter that they must serve this family whom they regard as undeserving of their service. I find a great parallel there to our world, which we sing joy to the world to. See, this hymn contains a very similar contrast to that. There is, in the wording of this hymn, the implicit expectation of what is befitting for a sovereign monarch. How should your king be received when he comes to your home to visit you? And there's the implicit acknowledgement that this wasn't what happened when God himself, when the rightful sovereign of this world came to that world. The Apostle John wrote in his introduction to the gospel, he came to his own people and they did not welcome him. But to all who did welcome him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Joy was offered the world. Joy that comes when the bringer of joy, the king himself, comes to the city. But it was only given to those who received him. For it is only in his presence that you can find true joy. If you don't receive the king, you can't receive his joy. Because there aren't any containers that hold his joy, except a heart that belongs to him. A heart that's been fully surrendered. Nothing else can hold the joy that God offers. Verse 2. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. When Isaac Watts composed the lyrics for this hymn, Psalm 98 was clearly in his mind. The Hebrew poem we know as Psalm 98 anticipates the time when God's salvation would be known by all the peoples of the world, 
with the result that the whole earth celebrates his goodness. Well, Watts turned those thoughts into an English poem that celebrates the coming of God's salvation in Christ and looks forward to the final fulfillment of his promise. Psalm 98 begins by noting that God has remembered his covenant, his promise to bring salvation to Israel, to make it known to all the nations of the earth. It sounds like it fits pretty well with Christmas. And the psalmist then calls for all of the people of the earth to break into shouts of joy, to burst into songs of praise. Let there be joy for all the world. And so we have our first line of this famous Christmas carol. And the rest of the psalm pictures nature itself bursting forth with jubilant song. And it is this picture that Watts reiterates with the second verse. Fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains. In short, the earth itself, inanimate creation making music to praise God. Creation singing. I cannot help but think of Jesus' words to the Pharisees. If these children are silenced, if you prevent them from praising, the very rocks themselves will cry out. Because creation's going to praise. Why should creation sing? Because the Lord has come to reign. He has exercised his kingly rule over all. The rocks and fields recognize their Lord. He waits only for the recognition that is due him from every human heart. Verse 3. No more let sins and sorrows grow nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessing flow, blessings flow far as the curse is found. Those plurals are all important there, by the way. Verse 3 is in many ways the most crucial verse of the entire hymn, and it brings us directly to the passages in Galatians and Romans that we read earlier. Verse 3 tells us the reason for the joy that is ours, the joy that comes when the king brings his salvation. Verse 3 reminds us that Christmas is not only connected to Easter, it's connected to Eden. The manger is tied to the cross because both of them are tied to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The beginning of the curse was laid on humanity and the earth itself ever since Adam's fall. Genesis 3, 17 to 19 is where we find the statement of the judgment of God upon Adam for his sin. To Adam he said, that is God said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Sins, plural, multiplied transgressions, the result of an inherited estrangement from God, an embedded inclination within us that insists on ruling our own lives instead of submitting to God. Sorrows. The result of living a disordered life, separated from the source of goodness and truth and peace and the only adequate source for true joy. And even the word itself, sorrows, the plural there, harkens back to the judgment pronounced upon Eve, the increase in sorrows and pains related to childbirth. Thorns. The result of living in conflict with nature as God created it, as God intended it to be. Instead of flourishing as God intended when he pronounced his blessing upon Adam and Eve, life became hard, work became misery, and the abundance, the fruitfulness that God built into the creation was damaged. And now instead of richness and plenty, there would be crop failures and toxic infestations that wreck the harvest and spoil the yield. Death, disintegration, and decay. The result of being cut off from the living God. The atheists are right in one point. If you remove God from the equation, all that's left us is matter and energy. 
And you and I are not but dust and chemicals held together for a little while and then disintegrating into our constituent building blocks. But Isaac Watts says, no! Psalm 98 says, no! The angels say, no! The angels told us a different story. There is joy that's available, purpose and meaning and the thrill of walking in the blessing of God who has come to make His blessings flow as far as that curse is found. That ancient judgment, that curse, that judgment that is universal. The whole race of humankind standing under this curse because we have all sinned. We have all insisted on being our own king. But now, Christmas has come. And Christmas means the true king has come to reign, to recapture the earth for himself, to recapture us for himself, to bring us mercy, to rule over us, to bring goodness and light and love and joy back, to restore us, to restore this world to the way God created it to be. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. He's come to bring his blessings as far as that curse found. Everywhere where that curse went, God intends to fill it with his blessings. Galatians 3 announced the, I'm sorry, Genesis 3 announced the curse upon humanity. The judgment of God stands over all of us who have rebelled against God. Galatians 3 quotes from Deuteronomy 27, 26, reiterating that curse in the context of the nation of Israel. Cursed is everyone who does not fully obey this law. So God's covenant people, all of those who don't continue to obey all the words of the Mosaic law, are under a curse. The expression of this curse in terms of the law of God with Israel. And the curse of the law is simply the restatement of the curse upon humanity of God's judgment. Death is the penalty for rebellion. It's just reiterated in the context of Israel's national life. And when Paul cites that in Galatians 3 and alludes to it in Romans 8, he is pointing to the problem that Christmas solves, our guilt and our condemnation before a holy God. But between Genesis 3 and Deuteronomy 27 stands Genesis 12. Between Adam's sin and the law of Israel comes the promise of God to Abraham. There's a righteousness that is possible that comes through faith. A way of salvation, deliverance from that judgment of God. There's a blessing that overcomes the curse, not just a blessing, not just something nice, a nice special favor from God. The blessing. He comes to make the blessing. A way to return to being right with God. A way to be restored to our original purpose, a way to receive the inheritance God has for each of us, the way to have the bounty of God that was always God's intention for us, to stand in that blessing, to be freed from the curse of sin and sorrows and of death itself. That is the promise of the gospel, the promise of Christmas, the promise of joy to the world. As Paul points out so eloquently in Galatians 3 and in Romans 8, this gift of God is of incomparable worth. It's easy to forget that if you've been around church a long time and you haven't paid attention or remembered what you used to be like or the people around you. You forget how valuable this is. There is nothing that can be compared to the salvation we have through faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter how hard life gets while we're on this journey, no matter how long this pandemic lasts, or how many tragedies and sorrows pile up all around us, no matter how deep your pain is or your loneliness or your heartbreak, joy is your inheritance. The blessing of God is yours through Christ. And your gift this Christmas and every day is joy that comes because of a manger and a cross. Verse 4, He rules the world. 
with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and the wonders of his love. Verse 4 brings us to the purpose for his coming. The Son of God, the King of heaven, did not come only to be a sacrifice for our sins. He certainly did that, for sure. But his ultimate goal was to restore humanity to himself, to restart the creation project anew and put it right. Jesus came to reign, to rule over us. But notice what the verse says. He rules the world with truth and grace. Truth and grace. Not with force and intimidation. Not with duplicity and threats. Not with swagger and boasting. Truth and grace. Not self-centered promotion and empty promises. Again, back to the Apostle John. He wrote these words in his introduction. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The Mosaic law was given as an instrument through which Israel might realize the governance of God over his people. But the fullness of God's governance came through Jesus Christ, the governance that comes when the King of heaven lives in the heart of everyone who will prepare him room. And when that happens, this hymn reminds us, then we'll see something spectacular. We'll see the nations of this world displaying the glories that come when we're ruled by God instead of being ruled by our self-interest. We'll see the peoples of the earth living in accordance with God's ways and sharing His love amongst themselves instead of living in hatred and fear and selfishness and violence. The key word for understanding this verse, though, is the little word prove. And Watts didn't put that there just so he'd have something to rhyme with love. No, there's, there's a, a really clear idea he is presenting. To catch it, though, we have to think a little bit about that little word. When he says he makes the nations prove, he's using the word prove in the same sense as when you had to do geometry problems in math class. Remember geometry? <laughs> in geometry... Teacher gives you a problem, you have to solve the problem, and you have to solve the problem to show how we know that a certain axiom is true. For instance, the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. Right? The teacher already knows this. All the people who know math already know this. They know that this axiom is true. And so the easy question is, well, if you already know it's true, why do we have to prove it? See, the point of the problem the point of the proving is that you have to show you understand the problem and the concept by demonstrating that you can prove this axiom to be the case, to be true. And that is what Isaac Watts' language means. It's not talking about triangles and geometry, but about demonstrating the truth of something. When Jesus Christ rules over people, we begin to live according to his word and according to his ways. And when we do that, his spirit starts to work in us so that we prove something to the nations. We put on display, we demonstrate what is real, that what Jesus says is true, that his governance worked, that this is what was supposed to be the case. Our lives reflect the goodness of God. And all the bounty and all the blessing that comes from being rightly related to the king of the universe, the king of heaven and earth, all of that, the glories, that is the marvelous goodness of life lived for God, that shows up in our every days. Because the king is ruling over us and making us prove, causing us to demonstrate the truth of his ways. The wonders of his love, the wonderful love of God and the powerful things that happen through his love show up as we live under the lordship of the king. As we live in the love of God, we're able to love others and the nations see what it's like and who God is and what his ways are. We bring joy to the world with our message and with our lives. God brings his joy to us and through us to the world, a world that's stuck in despair, 
stuck in fear, stuck in hatred, living like rats, desperate, angry, ready to attack anyone who comes close, who threatens to take their stuff. We bring joy because we've been set free from the curse and we've been made heirs with God of all that comes from living in his kingdom. The blessing of Abraham is ours because we've been set free from the curse. Salvation has given us joy. Blessing that is unmeasurable and unending.